Hey, you're watching A Fistful of Vinyl. My name's Alec, and my guest today is Eric Muller from Pirates Press Records. Thanks for being with me, man. Thanks for having me. Cool. You said you so you press records for people that like you don't necessarily like listen to or like would place in like your top ten artists. Mm -hmm. What what lens do you put bands through to figure out like if you're going to like bring them onto the label or if you're going to press a record for them? Um, initially, the label was very much just friends and groups like groups that we were friends with or close with or mm -hmm. tied into our specific scene, things like that. Um, we've branched out a little bit more, and we definitely get a lot of submissions from bands asking to be on the label now, mm -hmm. so it's more of a difficult task um, curating the label, but for the most part, it's still lots of friends, bands, and then just bands that we all love, that we as a group kind of, not by consensus necessarily, because there's plenty of bands that certain people don't like that we work with, but on a whole, they're, they're generally bands that everybody can look around the room and be like, yeah, I got respect for them, let's, let's work with them. Interesting. And you know, it's not a money making venture. If we didn't have the man the manufacturing company to pay the bills, so to speak, we wouldn't be able to do what we do with the label. Exactly. Uh, and the label very in it very much acts as an advertising arm for the manufacturing company, as mm -hmm. you initially mentioned with some of the creative releases. Oh yeah. A lot of that is showing our customer base what's possible. And sometimes it's expensive stuff that you need an example to show people how cool something is before you can actually show it off, you know? It was awesome. Word. Well, you were, you were telling me about um, another cool instance of vinyl that you guys have done. It was, so, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the basics right. It was a split with uh, Mischief Brew and Andrew Jackson Jihad that was acoustic on one, or it was Mischief Brew on one side, uh, AJJ on the other, but there was like concentric group. Well, tell, tell me exactly. about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it wrong. So Each tell me band about recorded it. the same song two different ways. One fully plugged in and one acoustic and we cut them using concentric grooves. So essentially, you cut two grooves, one starting from one point on the record, one starting from another, and they're cut concentrically. Like, so essentially, if you put the needle down on one side of the record, it'll play one, one version. If you put the needle down on the other side, it'll play the other version. And coincidentally, because records are so, so fragile or so finite, if you stamp on the oh, floor yes, next yeah. to the turntable, <laughs> it'll skip right into the other version, which is super cool. You time it perfectly. Man, I've, I've got to track down one of those. <laughs> there's, there's like a handful of them out there. I have two, one of each version of the color vinyl in my collection. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to find one of those. Um, we were kind of talking outside about like the marketability of vinyl being something that like has kind of moved from strictly like the like the niche audiophile types who like you know are in it for like the warmth of the sound mm -hmm. and like the kind of authenticity of it to having like a much fuller experience like and that's that's what i've always liked about vinyl. like i've always you know you know lifted a little bit of a sarcastic eye around people who say like vinyl sounds better it's like yeah but it's also super inconvenient so like i listen to it because the experience of sitting down and like putting on a record and seeing and like holding it in your hand and like physically placing the needle on there, all of that is a lot more exciting to me than just like clicking on an MP3 file mm -hmm. on like Google Music or something. We press a lot of records that in all honesty, I don't think a lot of people actually listen to. That people just collect, whether they're picture discs or like crazy black metal. Like black metal collectors oftentimes don't listen to all their records very much, but they treat them you know, somewhat like a baseball card yeah. where they're just creating a collection and it's a visual stimulus and a tie to a scene and like a connection to a scene that maybe if they're not in a band or involved in the production of that scene, so to speak, that's their connection to it and that's the way they feel close to it. And it's the same reason people still buy records at shows and things. They feel like that's their connection to the band. Exactly. And it's a huge component. And for us, being able to do such cool packaging allows us to like fit the bill for everybody, regardless of whether you're aesthetic-based or sound-based. We can make you the best quality product possible that's going to fit the bill for whatever your needs are. And with the label, we just try and show off like the coolest stuff that we can do. And you know, with some of the releases we do, I send them out, you know, promos to like radio people or reviewers and things like that, but I'm also sending promos out to my customers yeah. because, you know, Relapse Records, big metal label, like has a lot of Pirates Press Records releases in their office because we're showing them that we can do mill vinyl or hologram vinyl or box sets or things like that. And, you know, because the label isn't what pays our bills, we can do that comfortably and, you know, use it as an advertising arm of the company and 
and be able to bring in additional business and help our customers create more more cool products and creative ideas and stuff like that. Exactly. The creative seems to be like really at the core of it. And I think there's such like a, I mean, at least within punk marketing, it's like sometimes used as a dirty mm-hmm. word, but I think it's like super important to be able to showcase, like, you know, if, if you're doing right by the bands on the label, mm-hmm. then to not figure out a creative way to position them, not figure out a creative way to market them, is in a way not doing them justice. Completely. And mu- the music scene and the way we consume music has changed a lot. You guys started in 2005, mm-hmm. right? For just, the label, yeah. For the label, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So just between 2005 and now, we've seen like several eras of music consumption. Like, mm-hmm. I, I was just getting an iPod in 2005. Yeah. And now it's, I... And ripping all your CDs, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. you know, trading them with my friends, and I even got good at like burning the CDRs, and I had my little art, art style yeah. where I'd... And I don't remember the... I don't... I unplugged the CDR drive on my computer so it would run on lower power. That's how little I interact with CDs now. And I say that as a radio DJ. So I imagine moving through all those eras of music consumption, there's been a lot of uh, maneuverability required mm-hmm. of you guys to be able to stay up to date or even ahead of the curve. Definitely. What's what's kind of been challenging about that? What are some ways that you sort of overcome that, maybe preemptively or reactively? Well, I think we see the trends faster than a lot of other people in the manufacturing se- sector. Sure. Just because we're working with so many different clients. A lot of manufacture a lot of vinyl manufacturers are working with fewer clients who do larger runs. And our specialty is really small and mid-sized labels and keeping them happy doing 250 or 500 records. And because of that, we're just dealing with thousands of labels. So we see the trends really often. Like we're getting, you know, 150, 200 records back each week sometimes. So looking through them, you see what's going on and what's changing and the trends. And, you know, we work with our factory to kind of develop new things as ideas get stale, so to speak, or, you know, when other manufacturers figure out how to make a particular type of colored vinyl and it's no longer unique to us, we try and come up with something new. And, you know, like with the hologram vinyl that we just introduced in October, nobody else in the world can do that stuff. And so we're the only people. And we try and always kind of have some of those things. Same with the flexies. We developed the machines to make those in the Bay Area. And mm-hmm. for the last eight years, we've been the only company made. Yeah, those things are not. I'm going to pull I'm gonna pull one of these out. So. This is one of the things that I thought was really exciting is that, um, actually there's a bunch of stuff in here I want to talk about. So you're on tour with Barstool Preachers. I am. Right now. Um, and this is their record, Grazi Governo. Governo? Grazi Governo, yeah. Governo. Yeah. Like, that didn't Big sound- Thanks Governo. I was going to say, it didn't Italian. quite sound Italian enough. <laughs> I, I think I needed to move my hands more. Um, so there were a couple things in here just unpacking this record that I was really inspired by. So the first one is this kind of interior like record sleeve. Yeah, it's a stencil. Yeah. For people that can make their own merch or they can uh, not take our advice and stencil something in public, whatever they prefer to do. Exactly. Uh, well, one, this is so empowering because it's just, if you're passionate about the band, here's a way to kind of, like here's a tool or a brush through which you can like actually you know yeah. exhibit that passion. Yeah. Um, and I think similar to like, it, I'm interesting that you look through uh, almost everything that you do, almost everything that you interact with, you probably look through the lens of like, how can I tie this back to the label? Like totally. what, what what can this inspire in like vinyl manufacturing and the way we're marketing? We're big stencilers. Like we've got a, all of our fistful of vinyl t-shirts available on Patreon. Um, are just, we've done with stencils and spray paint or, or black shirt spray and uh, stencil and bleach. Uh, and it's cool because it makes a completely unique thing every single time. Um, and there's something about that sort of like non-typically manufactured quality that I think is really sick uh, and and empowering. Like, so I mean, I, I, the band focuses on their fans. That's really what it really comes down to. We wanted to create a package that gave them more than just a record. Yeah. You know, it's cool looking if that's all you're going to do. Like, the record came in that die cut, and the colored vinyl especially, you see it through the die cut holes, and it's brilliant. Yeah. But for people who actually want to take it a step further, it's, you know, it it adds another dimension to the package, which is uh, fantastic. Give him a shot at this right here. Yeah, and I, I understand, I say this with the highest praise, the coloring on this vinyl, which is beautiful, is the most boring part of this record. There's so much <laughs> other bullshit going on. 
Um, That's because you didn't get the lava vinyl because it sold out in about two weeks. <laughs> I believe but it. yeah, we, we made a few different versions. Uh, I think there were seven different versions of vinyl for that one. So a lot of them were actually packed with that stencil behind the jacket. So mm -hmm. if you saw them in a store or on the merch table, you can easily see what version it is too, which is kind of nice for people. Nice. Because um, like you said, it's, it's a marketing point of the record. Whether or not you want to use that word, if it's punk enough to use the word marketing or not, but who gives a shit, really? <laughs> the further I get into the punk scene, the more I experience the punk scene, the more, one, I get frustrated with gatekeepers. Like, people trying to delineate, like, what is and isn't punk. Yeah. And, uh, like, I've put out, we're close to 300 videos um, from all sorts of different bands. Yeah. And I would almost go as far as to say that like every band we've worked with is punk in a way, because to me like punk, punk is more like an ethos. It's that like DIY self empowerment. Mm -hmm. It's the engagement with fans. It's the desire not to like not care about expectations and do what you want to do. Do what you want to do and recognize the humanity in, mm -hmm. in yourself and everybody. Mm -hmm. Like I think like selling out is such like a, a, a interesting kind of I think dated topic because I think if a band can make money, make a living performing and being uh, musicians like they should especially nowadays when there's not CD sales to actually fund musicians the way there was I mean digital just took that away from people exactly. instead of selling 10,000 CDs and making yourself a hundred grand in revenue to deal with you're stuck with the Spotify check for 14 bucks <laughs> That's a generous one yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay so we've got we've got the DIY ethos we've got this sort of like egalitarian perspective um, we've, we've got this sort of uh, confidence in like what they're doing or like even just the accepting of like the imperfection of what they're doing. So like none of those th three things even really speak to sound per se. So it's almost like if you do all that and uh, distorted guitar and some shouty vocals, you're a punk band. But like I, I can't tell you how many times like, we posted a video by uh, Katie Ellen, you know, who's the, their lead singer is this, uh, this girl, Annika. She said these amazing, amazing pipes, and it's just really passionate music, mm -hmm. and they're involved in the punk scene, undoubtedly, but when I posted it, there's, a, you know, a handful of gatekeepers going, like, well, this isn't punk, and I just want to, like, take all those people, like, okay, like, stand over there, please, and then everyone else who's into it. Well, it's not your conversation. Punk. Yeah, you know, it's not your punk, but it might be their punk, or my punk, or somebody else's punk, and that's really what it's all about. It's like, why put your music in a box? Exactly. Really? Like, it becomes goofy to... to like try to categorize it in that way. Totally. Like, why shouldn't it be punk? Why yeah. shouldn't like the like these unifying factors that like all these bands engage in mm -hmm. be punk? And if that means finding an interesting way to like share your music with people, who's to say marketing itself isn't punk? I think maybe paying millions of dollars to an advertising firm to market your label as or, or, or record or whatever maybe isn't as punk as like finding a creative way to do it yourself. Yeah. But I think if it all stems from that DIY ethos, then it's fair game. That's a perfect, these are a perfect example of doing that, of like Which, promoting it like yeah. organically and grassroots and direct marketing kind of thing. So when I opened this, it took me a minute to figure out what it was. Um, so this is this is a 45, basically, it right? It's a flexi. A it's a flexi, flexi 45, which I've never felt so conflicted about how delicate vinyl is. Like, <laughs> there's part of me that's sick doing this yeah. because I'm so used to taking care of vinyl. But yeah. this is cool. It's 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 resilient. It's probably very cheap to manufacture. You were saying earlier you were giving these out as promo items. Yep. We've um, done almost 100,000 of them this year that we've given out for probably about 25 different bands at this point on the label. Awesome. Um, part of it was introducing this type of flexi to the market because mm -hmm. this is a brand new type of flexi that we started making in April. Okay. Previous to this, all the flexis were made on either clear or a colored material and foil stamped in the center, mm -hmm. which is more similar to the way they were in the 80s and the early 90s and stuff when you'd see them in magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and we developed a way to print on the back of the clear material to allow a full color image to shine through. And so it really opens up a lot of opportunities on an artistic level um, and on a, on a marketing level as well because we can actually make text visible on the back. So we can make them visually two-sided. Exactly. Which allows you to maybe sell the back to a sponsor or use the back to explain what the front is actually advertising or, or pushing on people. Yeah, it's, con it's, it's contextualizing. Mm -hmm. And so these three were the three music videos that the band made as a trilogy right. to lead into the, the new release of the record. So we took a still from each one and put it on the flexi with the information about the new record coming out. 
and you know we made five thousand of each of these and put some in the records in the colored vinyl version of the records but the rest of them went out to stores and distributors and some friends who have mail order companies and things like that to just spread the word both about the bands and also just the format itself and as a result of doing that we've gotten other magazines involved who want to put them in and we we made a we made a flexi for um the OCs for Mojo Magazine, oh, which nice. was 15,000. And then we made a Barstool Preachers uh, picture flexi that went in Viva La Rock, which was, I believe, 10,000. So, so, so this is scalable, it's cheap enough that you can give it away. How do people react when they are given this? Because I, I can't tell you how many shows like I've been to where like, you know, obviously I empathize with the bands for like, you know, trying to promote themselves and doing like whatever they can to, to share their music. Mm -hmm. I think in the same way that like music's so readily available online now, it's hard for it, or at least some of it, to not just kind of become noise, mm -hmm. to like blend in. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, I imagine I'm trying to like picture myself being at a show, being handed one of these. Like there's a whole lot of this going on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like people looking at it and going, "Whoa! I've never seen anything like this before." You know, we handed out. It, we don't discriminate, you know? There's like a 60-year-old man not looking like a punk at all, wearing jeans and Who's dress shoes. A yes, exactly. <laughs> he walks up, looks at the merch. Would you like a free record? And he hands it, you hand it to him, and he goes, he's processing it in his head, going, yeah. a free record? This doesn't, this isn't a record. Wait, what? Yeah. And they're looking at it in the what? light, and they see what the records groups. aren't free to this yeah. isn't <laughs> But that's like, like I, I have such like a... Like I'm always grateful to receive vinyl because to me that's such like a, a like a valuable gesture. Mm -hmm. We were saying earlier that like at least to my generation, our generation, CDs themselves aren't really as valuable anymore. Mm -hmm. They have less intrinsic value because we've been able to make them ourselves since we were kids. Definitely. This is like I don't know. It has like a little bit more of like a like a like a mystical quality to it, where you're given this and you don't quite understand how it works yet, and then you sort of get it conceptually, and it it's valuable. You're being given mm -hmm. a record. This is something that pe somebody put. Maybe you know as much thought into as they did a CD, mm -hmm. but this demonstrates that like that thought and worth so much more. Yeah, I mean we handed them to tons of kids last night at the show. I mean the Interrupters, who's the headlining band on the tour, yeah. they bring in lots and lots of kids under under fifteen, under sixteen. Sure. And they're coming up to the merch table and looking at T-shirts, and you hand them a free <laughs> record, and they go, "Oh, I don't have a record player." Oh, you. you and our saying? answer is. Christmas is coming up. <laughs> You're just ruin, ruining them financially for the future. Oh yeah, right? completely, like, completely. I love collecting records, but I whenever somebody asks, like, should I get into it? I go, no. It's like, <laughs> the least practical, most expensive <laughs> hobby you will have. Like, if you can avoid it, by all means, avoid it. But if you're in, I would love to talk to you about it. The one thing is, these are nice and thin, though. So you could collect like a thousand of these in the same space as like twenty LPs. Exactly. So, exactly. They're lightweight. Yep. And yeah. they're like baseball cards for record geeks, basically, right? That's super rad. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like futuristic and vintage at the same time. Totally. So we've been we've been spitballing. I believe it or not, I wrote an interview. Uh, we've covered a bunch of it so far, um, but let me see. Actually, damn, we've covered a lot of this so far. Um, okay, so this is one of the things I was kind of talking to you about before. In you know you you have like a lot of uh, like bands from like the oi punk scene. And I know that that scene has had sort of a complicated history, at least as far as it's been perceived by the media, where, uh, not speaking broadly about the scene, there have been, you know, fascist bands involved mm -hmm. in the scene, and those have... It's like that phrase is a grain of truth to every stereotype. Yeah. There's an element of whether you call it fascist or right-wing or whatever you want to call it, there's an element of the unsavory skinhead thing that you hear about in the media. Right. In truth, in the scene. So but on a whole, on a vast majority of the whole, of, of the entire scene, it is nothing like that. And it's very welcoming and inviting and embraces unity and camaraderie and a scene and exactly. humanity. Which and is a thing you can only get by... Being involved in the scene, but why, would a, up to why scene. would a news channel want to talk about that? Which pisses me <laughs> off. Because you only hear the negative. But to some people, that's their only perception of that Completely. punk scene. And you're never going to break that down now. Unfortunately, no, exactly. it's so ingrained, especially in America. Much less so in England, because the original wave of skinheads, there was plenty of publicity around it. There were negative elements sure. to it, especially um, through the through the eighties. Parts of it got way more political, and 
it wasn't a good thing for a lot of people to associate themselves with, especially when the American press really went gung-ho after skinheads. Right. And in America today, there's still plenty of people who call themselves skinheads that your first wave of English skinheads would look at them and go, they're not skinheads, they're boneheads. And so a lot of the, whether you call them center or left-wing skinheads, people who aren't racist skinheads will call racist skinheads boneheads. Boneheads, okay. Cool. Well, I appreciate the differentiation in terminology mm -hmm. because in a way there's two groups using the same, the same word. Mm -hmm. And there, while there is overlap between the groups, it really, really pisses me off that it's like, like, I hate that punk is seen that way because there are some just absolute dickheads mm -hmm. ruining it and using, like, mm -hmm. like, the punk name and the punk scene to mm -hmm. perpetuate this, you know, racist, phobic agenda when there are so many bands who are involved in the same scene and maybe even up to this point using the same terminology mm -hmm. who are being grouped in with them who want nothing to do with them. Yeah. And it's really frustrating. So, I mean, it just comes down to a, there are a few good bands out there who are politically, well, like well positioned and have fan bases and can be a spokesperson for the good elements of the oi and skinhead scene but it's tough there's so much of an ingrained stereotype that for people who aren't familiar with the history involved right. in the in, in the origins of it it's going to be virtually impossible to break it down so you know it's, so, it's let's, so let's tough. bring it back let's bring it back to marketing you're, you know, you're running this record label, you're uh, promoting a lot of these bands. Have you run into challenges in these sort of perceptions and how have you kind of overcome them? With that punk attitude, we don't give a fuck. <laughs> pardon, pardon the words, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's just about doing what you want to do. And we hold a lot of value in that scene. We have lots of friends who have lived their entire adult lives with that as part of their identity. Mm -hmm. And we embrace it. And the music and the bands who embrace that are bands that we like, many of them. There are plenty that we don't, but we tend to work with bands that we like the music, sure. first and foremost. Obviously, the politics should be in line as well, but... Ideally, yeah. You know, the most important thing for us is the people. And when the people and the ideology and the music all mesh well together, you get successful records and you know we've put out you know noise is a perfect example of a band that you know they, they wouldn't necessarily claim to be a skinhead band but well, they're gonna talk about them for being another cool kind of die cut example of and this is also a 45 right it is it is yeah. it's a single um it's the, a charity this record. part around here is not playable i think correct it's <laughs> the uh the vinyl is milled out after it's pressed that's really sick oh yeah me yeah. That record comes out on Black Friday, and all of the proceeds Ooh. from our side, from the band's side, and from our distributor's side are all getting donated to anti-gun violence charities that are chosen by the fans. Oh, interesting. So rather than the band attach their name to a particular charity, we've opened it up to fans to nominate 501c3 charities that have a goal of ending gun violence, especially with regards to children, which was the primary focus of the song and the 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 goal of the project. Mm. So first they nominate it and then we'll have a voting period where people could vote and then we'll give money to we'll basically divvy up the money three ways and give it to the three most voted on charities. That's really cool. I mean especially I mean maybe not especially but you know this week we're in California the shooting in Thousand Oaks yeah. just happened a few mm -hmm. days ago and it's it's her, her, too common that we're having that conversation. Well, that's, that's, that's what, what I was going to say. Like, to. Maybe it's not even fitting for this week because this has happened so many goddamn you times. Could, you, could, you could have just said that line, what week are we in the year? Like 40? You know, like you could probably say that 20 of those weeks. If you're in Chicago, you could probably say it every day. God, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so frustrating that the conversation is so immediately kind of hijacked as being about, strictly about like firearms rights and like you know, that almost preemptively it seems like there's like the, the counterattack before there's the attack where like, you know, typically conservative uh, uh, commentators and politicians will say like, look, they're going to try to take our guns away over this. Like, we're not going to let them. Like, California has like the worst gun laws or whatever. Like, where that seems to me like a very secondary problem to like, why do people think this is a necessary thing to be heard? Why do people think that this is the right way to display like their political ideologies or 
or like the amount of strife that they have themselves, be it personal, mm-hmm. political, societal, what have you. How do they get to the point to decide that like going and treating innocent people is the best way to display that? Ultimately, I think it's a conversation about mental health problems. A hundred percent. Because there's plenty of people who can own a gun safely oh, yeah. and can be responsible with a gun. And yeah. given the history of our country, people have the right to own a own firearm. And the issue that can really confront this in a big way is the mental health problems. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And yeah, it's I don't know, I, this is something we Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> uh. This is something we talk about for hours. I get really agitated when we're mm-hmm. talking about this. I'm going to tie it back to punk by asking, do you think there's a responsibility for punk bands being a traditionally activistic culture to have a voice or have an opinion on, on stuff like this or even just like have a platform that they kind of dedicate their own messaging to? Definitely. I mean, everybody's people. Everybody's a person. and Everybody has their own opinions. And when a band can form <clears throat> and create a consensus amongst the band to project something that's political... Yeah. It's not common in mainstream music. No. But it is common in punk. Whether it's vague or more specific with regards to a particular topic, it doesn't really matter. But ultimately, you know, we're political people. As people living in a society, we have to take responsibility for what goes on in our lives, in our society, in our towns and cities. And if you don't do that, arguably you're not being responsible. Yeah, especially and if you have a stage to do it on, mm-hmm. then you, you have, it seems to me you have that responsibility mm-hmm. to figure out what you're passionate about, mm-hmm. to figure out like what change would benefit society as a whole and try to perpetuate mm-hmm. that stage because you have a listening audience. And sometimes it means minimizing how political you are because you don't want to necessarily isolate people because the effect of having somebody become a fan of your music or art mm-hmm and then perhaps changing certain elements of the way they think because of the things that are coming out of your mouth is great, but you have to get them in the door first. Exactly. So you can't be too forward with your political message unless you're a Rage Against the Machine kind of artist where you already have an embedded, enormous fan base, you know? Well, it's, it's, funny, it's funny you bring that up. I, was, I had a, an interview with uh, Pat from Anti-Flag, and I was talking about kind of my introduction mm-hmm. to their band. I was on a, a, a trip with my family. I had a handful of their CDs that somebody had burned me because this was like 2005 <laughs> um, or even earlier than that but there was so <laughs> I told him he was okay with it um, but there's so many messages in there that were challenging for me being like you know 11, 12, 13 mm-hmm. years old because to me patriotism had been taught as like an unconditional um, like yeah, a stand up during the national anthem of the baseball game yeah and so to hear something different than that and have it still be called patriotism mm-hmm. was really interesting mm-hmm. to me because to me you know, now it's developed my my uh, sort of perspective that the truest patriots are the ones who hold their governments accountable, who actually believe. There you go. Um, but it, it's interesting because that was a very patient message for me. It took me a long time to get from like, "Whoa, this is different than anything I've ever heard," to like, "Here are the points of theirs that I agree with," and it's not mm-hmm. all their points, but there's many of their points that like mm-hmm. I've found that after a certain deal of like thought and like my own like moral and mental exploration like make a lot more sense to me than they did initially as mm-hmm. I matured. Um, well, we benefit as a society from dialogue, from communication, and if nothing else, provocative lyrics or a provocative message from a band evokes it. Even if you hate a band because of what they're saying, having that conversation is beneficial to the whole. Exactly. And a lot of times there is that trajectory of like hearing the message, rejecting it initially because it disagrees with mm-hmm. something that you, you've thought up to this point. Mm-hmm. And then it's almost like, it's almost like there's, a, there's this sort of like counteracting factor of liking a band enough to like, all right, I'll listen to it again and think about it again, but only because you guys have made really good music <laughs> so far. I know it's Rise Against for me yeah. for a long time. Um, they had a song, uh, Hero of War, that came out, gosh, probably four albums ago at this point. And that song was like really disconcerting to me at first because, um, I don't know, it was like I was, it, it, it painted like U.S. military operations in such a more uh, clouded and like personally vexing way than just like, you know, America going and bringing freedom to people. Yeah. Um, and it sings a song about a, a single soldier, you know, one who's, uh, you know, facing PTSD because, you know, they were in combat and they shot accidentally a non-combatant who was waving... Uh, like a white flag and and just 
it's hard to even say now, like, what about that was so uncomfortable to listen to or was so uncomfortable to think about, but it was the fact that Rise Against had been a band that had, like, you know, been with me for so long and who I kind of trusted that, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to try again to get the message out of this. And eventually, like, it, it changed my perspective where, mm -hmm. I mean, I absolutely su uh, support, like, the plight of the soldier. I don't support war, but I support the plight of the soldier. And it seems to me the biggest personal sacrifice they made, tying it back to mental health, is, like, we get really sick when we're forced to kill each other. That's mm -hmm. really bad for our brains. Yeah. And now we have to, you know, like, they, they come back. They, in many cases, don't get the amount of support that they need from, like, their VAs or from, like, the mental health care that they would receive here for, like, understanding what they've been through. Mm -hmm. And then it leads to these sort of, like, explosive moments where, you know, that's ultimately mishandled. Or there have to be countless people who've more or less been treated by music, though. Yeah. They, they're well, that is one getting of the best involved forms of in punk or getting involved in a scene that is welcoming to people of all perspectives and realizing that you know, war is horrible, but this is an outlet for people to have a dialogue about Absolutely. what's going on in the world and in their own minds sometimes. And plenty of bands write really introverted lyrics and lyrics that anybody can, in, in a sense, interpret in their own way, but they're empowering. Yeah. And that's really, you know, something that we love as a label is really passionate lyrics like that drive people to be better people. Be, be a better citizen, be a better scene member, whatever, you know, and that's where we all benefit, is if everybody has that same perspective, the world gets better. It's exactly. like rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's a very much like an empathetic uh, global citizenship perspective, where mm -hmm. there's so much more that makes us alike than different, that like mm -hmm. being able to have those conversations and remind ourselves of that is I think probably the healthiest thing we can do as a society. Definitely. And it's interesting you bring up the idea of like punk lyrics becoming more introspective, because this is a conversation Kirk and I have had a lot, where there's to us kind of been this, um, this sort of change inward for punk music, where there was a time where so much of punk was like overtly political, over, you know, overtly at activistic, that so much of it now has become more about the exploration of the self, and, and like, you know, dealing with like your own emotions, or your own like, at times compromised. It's all, there's stuff stand. all, it's, it's everywhere. You know, you can find an example of punk bands doing all of the things, whether mm -hmm. it's super political or apolitical or just about people and bettering people's lives or just very introspective. Like you said, it's all out there for people to grab hold of whatever they want to grab hold of, really. And, if, yeah. and well, I think that's the best point because there's, in the same way that so many punk brands are broad or the punk scene is so broad with like the way that their brands, the way that their bands uh, promote their messaging, I think so too are the audience members who like maybe someone will empathize with, you know, the, like the very like overt outspoken political ideologies mm -hmm. and others will uh, empathize more with like, this is how I feel as an individual when I'm by myself or when I'm like in a crowd and lonely and yeah. um, feeling kind of whatever you identify with is kind of what draws you in. So mm -hmm. it's cool to me that those are all a part of the same broad scene. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, however, see too many of the overly political bands getting much mainstream support. There are yeah. punk bands who do get you know, radio play and things that, you know, from a punk perspective might not seem cool, but ultimately, as somebody who cares about a particular type of music, you want that music to be sustainable and yeah. to grow and get better and stronger as a scene. And if you're not getting support from all kinds of places, it just won't happen. Exactly. But, you know, the bands like your Blink-182s and all those pop-punk bands that started in the late 90s and early 2000s getting big and getting mainstream support you don't see a whole lot of that anymore as far as like new bands the bands that you see gain support like the interrupters are a perfect example are writing music from the heart that's meant to affect people and meant to teach people that you are part of this society and you can't just be only be a fan of songs about girls or songs about love and there's more to it than that. And caring, and caring about the person next to you, or your neighbor, or somebody 3,000 miles away who might be affected by gun violence. Like, those are the things that matter today. And it's kind of all in our faces a bit more than it has been in the past. So it makes it even 
more of an impassioned message these days. Yeah. So you have a lot of these, like, kind of very creatively packaged, very creatively manufactured, um, you know, vinyl elements. Some of these are so ambitious I wouldn't have thought a, a label or a press would be able to pull them off. Have you gotten any ideas that you've tried to pull off and they haven't worked or like you haven't figured out how to do yet? Like what's been kind of on the high end of ambition that's maybe not quite accomplished yet? For the label, I don't really run into too many issues like that only because as a manufacturer, I'm well aware of all the limitations in sure. the technology with regards to the records or the packaging and things like that. So for the most part, I don't try and take on something that we can't pull off. Mm -hmm. um, but we have plenty of customers who try to do that. So we definitely manufacture records for people that are trying to push the limits with regards to packaging, same way we do with our label. But oftentimes they're not necessarily as aware of all the limitations, so they try and do things that we can't really pull off. But sure. we work with our factory to try and do some amazing things. So what are you most proud of having pulled off from like sort of an abstract vinyl perspective? From an abstract perspective, I would say that the flexies are the thing we're probably the most proud of. We mm. actually built the machines to make them from scratch. Um, we tried to do research on how they were made in the past and read through the patents and decided to kind of throw them out the window and do our own thing. And we kind of re reverse engineered it, so to speak, using um, our source for the stampers that would be making the records and using machines that were made originally to produce flooring created three machines to make flexies. Oh, and, yeah. Um, we had an order from Swiss Post who does all of the currency in Europe okay. for a flexi for Queen's Day in Holland and it was for 450,000 of them and the center popped out and was a five euro postage stamp Oh. And because of the security that would have been needed to produce that in our office in San Francisco and also the transport to get 450,000 of them to Europe, we actually found it cheaper to move the whole operation into our normal vinyl pressing facility in the Czech Republic. So we moved that over, I believe it was in 2013 now. So we get the added benefits of all the awesome quality control and all of the other things that our factory is doing on much more of a scientific level than what we were doing, which was you know, very DIY and yeah, punk. Yeah, yeah. And so now the development of the flexies over the course of the eight years that we've been making them has been fantastic. The sound quality is way better. And now we have the option of doing these picture flexies, which really has changed the game. Yeah. Is this, is this the rabbit from Donnie Darko? I, uh, I believe it is. Damn. Yeah. That's just making me feel a little bit unnerved because that movie, uh, I don't know, fucked me up when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> These guys know how to create a good video, that oh, is yeah. for no, I, sure. I really enjoyed watching the series. Uh, wait, did, did you pull it off, the uh, the uh, postage stamp flexi? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did? did it. It good was work. awesome. Long term, what Pirates Press Records, what do you, what do you, like, what looks like success for you? Or what, what milestone are you, like, most excited to reach in the long term? Um, as far as independent labels go, a lot of us at, at Pirates really look up to Epitaph. Okay. And especially like the Hellcat segment of it that took place, especially back in the late 90s when they were really pumping out release after release for Drunk Murphys and Rancid and uh, US Bombs and all oh, yeah. these bands. And the one thing that really tied it all together was that they were going on tour together and they were creating like really a scene around this oh, yeah. label. And we've done a lot of that. We've done you know, putting bands on tour with each other is one of the things that we really haven't been able to take full advantage of because there's just not a whole lot of good music out there in scenes across America that's supporting live music. And bands are not treated nearly as good in America as they are in Europe. And so we find that a lot of our bands are really only playing locally where it's convenient and there's no overhead. They're not really willing to go on tour. But one of the things we're trying to focus on is, is finding those bands who are willing to make that sacrifice and to bring our label out to the masses, so to speak. And that's one of the things that I would see as like successful is more of that going on from the label's perspective where you know, it becomes a household name, the same way Epitaph is now virtually a household name in the music industry. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and we're getting there, and we're definitely there in specific scenes and in certain cities and things like that. But, you know, we want to be a little bit more broad with the kind of music that we're putting out and bringing more people in. Um, the conversation we had about the oi and skinhead subculture, like you said, is it's very difficult because a lot of people are initially turned off by their stereotype of it. While there are very welcoming and embracing 
the band's embracing unity and, and a really positive message that's great for kids, especially oh, yeah. kids who are getting into music, that we want to bring them in. And oftentimes that involves bands that might not fit that mold, firstly, but aren't that far removed from it. So we're trying to really bring people in and, and cater to a younger crowd, more or less, because that's the future of our scene and of our type of music is new bands. And there haven't been a lot of successful new young bands that are appealing to a young crowd. And that's one of the things that we're trying to focus on as a label through bands like the Barstool Preachers and you know lots of the other bands that we're working with, trying to get them to be more inviting to a younger crowd because, you know, 30 and 40 year old people aren't the market that we want to be pushing our records to. As much as they're, they're, they are the people who buy a majority of our oh, records sure. already, they're not the new group of people that we want to be starting to buy our records. It's the kids, because that's the future of the whole thing. Definitely. Yeah, it's, and I can say that personally, like, being a kid in the punk scene growing up was hugely foundational for me. Like, I learned, uh, like, unity through being in a mosh pit. And I think there's so many perceptions, not just of, um, you know, like, racial political elements, but just of, like, overtly aggressive elements from mm -hmm. outside the punk scene that, like, once you get into it, the aggression that the punk scene seems to have isn't as much anger-based as it is passion-based. Mm -hmm. Like it, com it can come across as angry, and at times it is angry at something, yeah. but it's not misplaced. Well, it's funny. You see 1,500 people with their fists in the air screaming along to a band, but they're not angry at anything except for maybe society or whatever the song's about or, you know, just authority in general sometimes. Like, that's what it's all about. It's really just about having passion, like you said. And, mm -hmm. You know, people are people, and everybody has their own personal opinions about politics and about friends and family in the scene and those kind of things, but the passion is the underlying thing that pretty much everybody has. If you're not passionate about life, then what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> not being a good punk. <laughs> you're not being a good human being. If Damn you're not finding your, finding your passions and embracing them and living them. Damn straight. Well, I like to end all of our interviews uh, the same way. This is a D20. We used to uh, play Dungeons and Dragons. Give this a toss. I got a list of questions and let's see, uh, let's see what comes up. All right. Fifteen. Fifteen. All right, all right. This is a uh, this is twofold. You got a lot of tattoos. Um, what's okay? Either what's the worst tattoo you've ever seen, or explain a tattoo of yours. Whatever you feel like more. Because I'm in LA right now, I'll be the complete jerk and be like, "That's my Red Sox oh, tattoo." Oh man. And I'm fourth generation Red Sox fan. My kids are fifth generation. My dad's had season tickets at Fenway since 1978. We watched game two, or game one and game two at Fenway. Flew back home, drove down here, watched the other two wins in LA, and it was epic. Man, this interview isn't being broadcast live, but at the same time, don't be surprised if you find your tires slashed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I drove my friend's car, so hopefully not. You thought it <laughs> Word, well, um, Inside and outside of your label, what what are you listening to right now? What bands aren't getting enough attention that you feel like people should be listening to? Uh, one of the bands I'm listening to the most right now is Barstool Preachers. Sure. Not because they're my friends and my family or on my label, but because of the music and because of the message. And with them on tour with the Interrupters right now, the two messages are going hand in hand. And it, I've been so proud putting out the very first two Interrupters singles and now seeing the evolution of that band and seeing them embraced by radio stations like K-Rock and others and just getting mainstream radio play with straight up punk and ska songs that have a really positive message about unity. Yeah. It's amazing. And going to shows and seeing families of parents and kids who are equally passionate about the same band, it's almost a unique thing. It's very rare for a new band. You see it sometimes where parents have been fans of a band for a decade or two, sure. and they get their kids into it. That you see more common. You see kids at a Rancid show or a Dropkick Murphy show, yeah, yeah. things like that. But the Interrupters are a new band, and so you have parents who've only been fans of the band the same amount of time as the kids, and they're equally passionate, like watching, you know, 300 kids and parents line up at the merch table to buy t-shirts, and the kids are buying stuff, and the parents are buying stuff, and it's just brilliant. And the Barstool Preachers are side by side with them delivering that same message and doing it in a way that's accessible by kids. And those are the two bands right now that are really doing it for me most of all.
Nice, man. Very cool. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for coming all the way to my apartment for this interview. This has been super cool. Uh, thanks well. for Thank teaching you. me so much about running, uh, you know, an independent vinyl label and and you know, kind of figuring out how to position and promote these bands who are making cool music and you know, in a scene in a time where it's challenging to do so. I'm really inspired by that. Thank you. Thank you for your support and your listeners as well. We appreciate all the support that everybody's giving our label right now and the manufacturing company as well. Word. Uh, where, where should people go to find your uh, find your label stuff? The label is PiratesPressRecords.com. Cool. And the manufacturing company is PiratesPress.com. And you can find all the links there. And feel free to drop us a line if you'd like some free, free flexi discs. We uh, have plenty of them that we're more than happy to send out gift packs to people from. Yeah. So. Mention Fistful of Vinyl, you get a 100% discount on those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, free product, even freer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll, I'll cover it, I'll cover it, don't worry. Yeah, we'll but, send you the bill for the postage, don't worry. <laughs> great, I have at least some, I've got like $9 my wallet. <laughs> I'll just give it to you now. But anyway, man, cool, this has been awesome. Uh, thanks very much. And thank you guys for watching Fistful of Vinyl. Um, I don't know, fistfulofvinyl.com, afistfulofvinyl.com. And Patreon, Facebook, Instagram, all that. I'm so bad at promoting ourselves. Can you just marketing? Can you guys just pretend I gave a really serious plug to all of our social media and websites and be like, "Wow, that was convincing!" And just go, cool. All right, thanks. Word. What's that? We use all of our B-roll stuff after after the videos. You definitely do. You yeah. definitely do. Yeah. Um, um, but, like, you, but you work with enough like like oi bands that I oh, figure yeah. you would have had like experiences kind of surrounding most definitely that. Yeah. Don't be off on sure. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You know that